I'm Nathan Bynum, your host for Youth Can Change the World. This week, I'll be talking with Bree Mathers, founder of Love the Skin You're In. For three years, the Global Collab Network led the effort to bring Bree to the region, where she has wowed the hearts of young women in ways that continue to have lasting ripples across Arlington and Fairfax County. Her presentation engaged the life force of students who continue to talk about the impact and are taking active measures to achieve the vision of a world where women's voices and minds are highly valued and where people of all backgrounds are encouraged to love the skin they're in. Welcome to the show, Bree. I am so glad to have you here. Thank you, Nathan. I'm happy to be here. Um, so you've come uh, all the way from, where, where are you mainly residing these days? I am based in Northern California. Well, thanks for coming out. First, I want you to tell us a little bit about your work that you do. Okay. Which um, I, underst I understand your organization is Love the Skin You're In. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. So Love the Skin You're In is a multimedia motivational assembly. The signature talk, Love the Skin You're In, is designed for female student bodies in high schools. So it's delivered normally 500 girls at a time in an auditorium. Wow. And it demystifies prevalent representations of women in the media and reawakens young women to a connected sisterhood and to the spirit of solidarity and hopefully inspires them to re-envision themselves as leaders of a softer world. What inspired you to invest your energy yeah. in empowering young girls or young women? Yeah. Uh, so that's a long story, and the inspiration always continues. But my story is that I was an Ontario provincial track champion when I was in, in high school. Wow. And I was ranked sixth in North America for my time. And shortly after that, I wound up with anorexia. Mm. And so I went through this long, dark night of the soul in my recovery journey. And as I was finding my own way, I was sitting at the cafeteria table with my girlfriends and noticing that pretty much every one of them was engaged in a disparaging conversation about their bodies. Hmm. And I was blessed because I had a mentor at the time who was a 10 to 12 years older than me. And she introduced me to the book, The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf. Mm -hmm. and to the book Revolution from Within by Gloria Steinem. Mm. And you might say that my journey as a feminist activist was born within the pages of those books. I read those books and they spoke to me. Yeah. And I felt, I just felt, I just developed this fire in my belly that I have to be part of changing this inner narrative that has become so pervasive for young women. And especially when I you know, experience the empowerment of recognizing the socioeconomic underpinnings of beauty norms myself, that helped me to really more deeply engage my own recovery process and the natural, you know, flowering of that recovery journey was to give it back. And so I mm -hmm. developed Love the Skin You're In as a, as a way of creating social change, especially in the lives of young women. That's amazing. What are some of the things from those two books that really stick out for you? Um, well, Naomi Wolf, is an, she's an incredibly powerful and profound mm -hmm. writer. And basically learning that all of these industries that are at play and trying to carve out how we see, so you've got the plastic surgery industry, the beauty industry, the cosmetics mm -hmm. industry, the fashion industry, you now have Silicon Valley's social media industry, Hollywood industry, on and on and on. That all of these all of these industries basically have a vested interest in creating this sense of impoverish impoverishment. Hmm. Like they they want us to feel like we lack something, so that we can then be relied on at the end of the day to spend more money. Hmm. And what what they're really after is to train us from hmm. the earliest age possible to think less and buy more. And so the so sense think less of yourself think and less, buy more to make it better? Or? No, not just think less of yourself, but think less. Like, don't think too critically about what you're seeing. Oh, just yeah. kind of like think mm -hmm. less altogether and go out there and just run the credit card over and over again. Yeah. So the three central tenets in Naomi Wolf's book, are she, she basically defines this thing called the beauty myth, uh -huh. which is, you know, recognizing that this ideal that we're being taught that we all need to look like, she tends uh -huh. to be 
tall. She tends to be Caucasian. You know, Mm -hmm. she tends to have blonde hair and blue eyes. And this whole socioeconomic, all these industries are kind of driven around this idea that all women need to look like that. Right. And um, unfortunately, to a large extent, those industries are thriving. (laughs) Yeah, they certainly are. At the mental health costs of young women. Right. And if people aren't insecure, then they're not going to be as quick to pull out their credit card and buy something to make themselves feel better. If we all felt that we were whole and complete and perfect exactly as we are in every moment, would we spend as much time in shopping malls? I don't (laughs) think so. (laughs) Yeah, I wonder if we'd spend as much time online shopping even. (laughs) Well, this is a great point, too. And like the whole online uh, world is a whole other conversation. But what I've seen in the years that I've been doing this talk is that the mental health, uh, just the mental health statistics have really escalated, in particular in the last five years when it comes to young women's health. So mm. you've got the Girl Scout State of Girls report from 2017 talking about 23% of grade nine girls contemplating suicide. Jeez. You have very serious statistics. And that's up from? It's up dramatically. Mm. You have, you know, 48 and 50% of young women feeling alienated socially alienated and depressed now. I mean, you know, these, all of these, um, all these statistics have just kind of exponentially suddenly bloomed in Mm. space and they've bloomed alongside the social media revolution and this whole industry in Silicon Valley, which is basically training them into screen addiction before their, their brains are old enough to moderate their use Right of of the platforms that they are, um, well, they think that they're consumers, but they're not actually the mm-hmm. consumers. You know, their their eyeball time is being bought, and that's the product. They're the product. That's right. And all that they're seeing are images that are unrealistic. Yeah, there's a big prevalence in terms of, of this. An ideal. There's a big prevalence of this kind of thinspiration or fitspiration on on Instagram, and it's just another place where you see you know, a lot of these images that are taken, it's four hours in the making to get this particular angle and coloring and makeup and whatever just right. And then that particular model, of course, is actually funded by X corporation in order to be making a whole life and livelihood out of producing those images that are highly, highly manufactured. Mm -hmm. And then you put that in the hands of an 11-year-old. And if you don't, you know, put limits on Right. that time or if you're not watching over what is actually being consumed then then that can have an escalating mental health consequence so we've set up a huge amount of the challenges that we face yeah you know? um and you come in mm-hmm. at the challenges and yeah. and you're trying to address them i do how do you do that <laughs> <laughs> well i do that by taking the young women on a journey and Part of my journey, part of my recovery journey was the discovery of mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. And so I spend a lot of time on my own Zen meditation cushion and I sit a couple of week-long retreats a year, Mm -hmm. sort of meditating 10 hours a day. And I start first and foremost by bringing that kind of energy into the room. So there does tend to be this this dropping into this basic sense of of trust Mm -hmm. and just recognition of this awareness that we all share and this wonderful mystery that is breathing all of us. And then from there, I take them on a journey that okay, demystifies prevalent representations of women in the media. I use a combination of humor and then we'll go from humor to you know, the anchor dropping really deeply and I show them an image that was drawn of someone's struggle with an eating disorder Mm -hmm. and it's a painful and harrowing image but it's also a really wonderful uh, turning opportunity. It's a really catalytic opportunity because young women see this image and empathy, you know, just naturally kind of flourishes in them. Like, is there anyone in this room that would ever want it? to get to this point. And we don't know what someone else is coming home to. They might be going home to alcoholism or domestic violence. And the best thing that we can do is be kind. And that Mm -hmm. starts with talking to ourselves the way that we would talk to someone that we love. And if we start taking that on as a practice, 
rather than this kind of disparaging conversation that we've been trained into by the culture at large, then it's much more likely than that's what we're going to be offering one another. Mm -hmm. Then it's much more likely that we're going to choose to forge connection and sisterhood with one another, also by recognizing the universality of how we're all being inundated and indoctrinated with this basic mm -hmm. brainwashing. I think it's interesting, the talking to to ourselves the way that we would talk to someone we would love. Yeah. Because I've I've noticed too that um, often people and I don't know if it's more prevalent in young girls, but it may be mm -hmm. when they say things about themselves, it's more likely to be negative than mm -hmm. when they're talking to a friend that they care about. Yeah. Um, and if that bridge can be can be made, where you know what I need to treat myself like my best friend, like I would treat my best friend, then maybe that's a concrete way they can make a step forward. It's a huge step forward to start to make that commitment because what I've seen, so in doing research and starting to interview young women for a, our documentary, which is called You Got This, Owning Body Image, what we saw was this trend toward this mirror gazing activity mm -hmm. wherein they would either before school or after school come home fixate on some aspect of their appearance that they mm -hmm. don't like. And if it's before they go at the door to school, think, I need to change this. And then, and that's what they leave the house on, is this idea that they're not okay the way that they are and this sense of dissatisfaction with their physical appearance. And of course, the body has just very naturally become the go-to for any other stresses that they're facing. So mm. if they're facing academic stress or they are struggling socially or there's just something happening with an intimate partner or family stress, whatever that is, uh, the body tends to become the site where that stress gets worked out. Hmm. And that that tends to be a fairly universal experience for for young women and wow. across cultures as well. I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. That uh, other problems could be concentrated in in body image. They get know. translated into it huh. because it's it it's already there. Like so, I think that neurological superhighway that they're all trained into at such an early age. I mean, right. they're really taught to hate their bodies from a young age because it's really hard to you know, be free of the dominant cultural mm -hmm. paradigm. And so once they feel that anxiety or sadness about any aspect, the natural thing to do, and anxiety and sadness, depression, that's all a contraction anyways. Mm -hmm. But the most natural thing to do is to to contract and to right. turn inwards. And then where are you? Here you've got your body and already the world around you is telling you that that body isn't okay. Mm -hmm. And so that that becomes how it, it gets translated often. Wow. That's why we have so much body dissatisfaction, too. Mm -hmm. And you're also trying to train them to respect their minds is more because yeah. you're trying to get them to think. I'm intent on young women recognizing that their voices and imaginations are what the future of our Earth mm -hmm. depend on. Mm -hmm. And I believe that to be true. I mean, look, there was a study done by the Center for Partnership Studies in Pacific Grove, California, and they looked at 89 different nations around the world. And what they found was that in societies where women were occupying more parliamentary seats, what went along with that was more caregiving legislation, legislation mm -hmm. that actually worked really well for men and women and children and the planet. Mm -hmm. So, it, and, and also that the, um, that the status of women is, um, you know, a greater indicator of a country's long-term economic prosperity and social well-being. Mm -hmm. So it's really the, the best and most important place. We can focus as we're trying to solve all of the world's problems. Really, the empowerment of women, for me, is, is number one. That is the medium through which we can really start to face all of these other catastrophic issues that we're facing, like climate mm -hmm. change, yeah. like overpopulation. And purely from a... If you want to get the best minds running the world, and if you cut out half those minds um, or make it a lot less likely that they will be in positions of power, then you're not going to get the best minds running the world <laughs> because no. you don't have as big a pool to draw from. That's right. And like, look at our world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> our world issues. is a prime example of exactly we what we're talking issues. about right now. Silicon Valley is another great example. So 98% of funded ventures in Silicon Valley 
are male driven. Right. So only 2% of funded ventures are female driven. And if we're not willing to, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. offer the dollars to women and, and mm -hmm. let them know that their voices and minds and imaginations count, then we're going to wind up with platforms like Snapchat and Instagram, which, which are going to be inherently limited because we don't have female vision behind them. Yeah, we need both. Yeah. And right now we're way heavily weighted towards the male vision of leading things. Yeah. Um, I understand you also do talks for boys. I do. And um, I'm, I'm, I understand those are also empowering. <laughs> they are. <laughs> so how is it different, empowering girls versus empowering boys? Well, I um, take a little bit of a different approach with the boys' talk. With the, I just did a middle school boys' talk, and I have a colleague who's a musician, and we brought this large Native American drum into the room, and he drummed the boys into the room, and we we turned it into more of a rites of passage hero's journey, mm -hmm. because men also have a very limited narrative. They know they're being typecast into these straitjacket gender roles that don't work for them. Yeah. They're, they're being basically corralled into this tiny spectrum of emotion that's basically anger, or, or anger, you know, not being allowed to feel their feelings, not being allowed to cry, mm -hmm. not being able to acknowledge that connection and belonging is a human need that we all need. And so right. we have a paucity of male narratives that are really truly empowering and supportive for our men. And I like to bring that piece really forward. And, and I also like to share some of the young women's curriculum with the men so that they can see the way that they too are being seduced by these ideals mm -hmm. and the way that they're being conditioned into being attracted to, you know, one single ideal that, that may not be what they actually feel. And so the idea with all of this is to break us all free from the shackles of this culture so that we can recognize our common humanity, our common capacity for empathy, and mm -hmm. our common need to connect and belong. Mas uh, patriarchy doesn't work well for boys either, is what no, you're saying. it doesn't. And matriarchy is not the opposite of patriarchy. Partnership is. Right. And so partnership is, is about basing ourselves in more feminine values like reciprocity, mutuality, interdependence, respect, nurture, mm -hmm. softness. These are all of the things that we need to see more of and that, that enable a partnership system versus you know, a domination system. And Rianne Eisler's book, The Chalice and the Blade, which is now 30 years old, they just celebrated their 30th birthday wow. last week, in fact, uh, gives a wonderful, just, just a wonderful history of how we got where we are right now. And that, that actually, if you go back 10 and 30,000 years ago, in these goddess worshiping cultures where women's bodies were seen as a site of life and illumination and mystery, mm -hmm. um, what went along with that reverence for the female body was a more partnership model. And so women were at the helm, but leadership was shared between men and women. And, and then what also happened inside of these cultures was there was relative peace. Mm -hmm. That being the thing that we most need and that, that we all really want right. to see. And um, right now we're in a situation, I, I've, I've, I was a school counselor for like, seven years. Oh, you were. And it was in a middle school. And it was interesting because I came across a lot of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And also, I was the only male there, which is interesting because in um, child rearing settings, often men's voices are absent. That's right. And in ha halls of power, often women's voices are absent. That's right. Um, so... I noticed that I would have to speak up, you know, I would say something in a meeting and someone would say the same exact thing, mm -hmm. a woman, mm -hmm. and it was in a child care setting, mm -hmm. and what they said would be acknowledged, uh -huh. just as in the corporate boardroom, often a woman will say something and then a man says the same exact thing, yeah. and the man is acknowledged. Right. Um, so it may be that the things we talk about as being feminine like what you're talking about in terms of um of you know of interdependence mm -hmm. um 
they are things that are present in men as well. Yeah. It's just that men aren't as rewarded for showing them. <laughs> That's right. And femininity and masculinity exist in both of us, right? It's like our yin and our yang. And we all have both of these. I think of them as energy systems because I'm a yogini. Okay. You know, and we both have like the feminine and the masculine energy system. And we have a world at large that has an imbalanced yang, right? We have too much yang. That's why we have so much war and conflict and divisiveness. Mm -hmm. And, and not enough yin. So if we can all further empower that yin within us, um, and you know what you talk about is so true. That's why I love these Scandinavian countries or my native Canada, because you see paternity leave as, as a very viable option for dads. Mm -hmm. And often if the mom is in a career where she happens to be making more money, then the dad stays home and he's mm -hmm. raising the kids. And this is completely socially acceptable. Right. And so it would be wonderful for this kind of ethos to really you know, percolate into and, and permeate the United States more. I think that would be of great benefit yeah. to all of us. And it also disarms the very simplistic attack on feminism that it's anti-men because it's not if it's done mm -hmm. the way that you're talking about it's pro yeah. everyone you know. yeah um, I, and that brings me back to naomi wolf's uh her definition of feminism is love given freely between equals is is the child of the women's movement mm. and i remember those words because i remember reading them and i was like this is it this is this is what i want my life to be an embodiment for for this kind of social justice and and really the work that I do is about taking a stand for love. It's mm -hmm. about taking a stand for that love that lives in all of these young men and all of these young women and help them translate that which is inside of them, you know, into the way that they relate to one another and, and you know, lift the veils on everything around them that's right. feeding them a bunch of lies. Yeah, yeah. Shifting the culture. Yeah. So... In these workshops that you do, like, mm -hmm. what would it be like if I, if, if there's a, I know that you give a workshop for 500 um, girls at a time. Mm -hmm. And is there, is there a follow-up to that or is it, um, how, does, how does that all work? So there's lots of different options for follow-up. In fact, it's very special that I'm able to be here with you on CV today. It was actually because of an existing NGO here that my work came to Arlington in the first place. So mm -hmm. Linda Staley is the founding director of the Global Collab Network and we right. met at a conference um, that was part of Stanford's Global Innovation Summit. We were both presenting on a panel together and she said, I need to bring you and your work to Arlington. Our girls really need it. And so so she and a couple of moms worked for two and a half years hard to, to mm -hmm. get Arlington Public Schools on board with bringing Love the Skinner into town. And they hosted these living room salons, which are designed to incubate change and, you know, really celebrate communication between the generations and, and mm -hmm. basically right. activate social change. Right. So those salons were what brought Love the Skinner into town. And we're also having those salons and hosting those salons after every talk. So after so after the H.B. Woodlong talk that I did last year, we met in her living room and 15 girls from the talk came and we talked about, okay, well, how can we part, spark more resiliency and how can we turn this into a movement and how can we connect with existing social clubs within our school or create our own? And right. there were beautiful things that happened out of that salon. I mean, one of them was uh, Body Posse Avery. Oh, uh, we're going to get to meet her in the next yeah. uh, show. <laughs> so Body Posse Avery, who um, saw the talk, and she was struggling with the same kind of disparaging internal dialogue that most young women are caught up in. And But there was a spark that happened for her. And, mm. and we spent some time building a relationship, and she went ahead and started an Instagram channel Mm -hmm. celebrating the diversity of women's bodies. And mm -hmm. she now has nearly 2,000 followers and gets over 600 likes on everything she posts wow. and, and 25 engagements. Mm. And we couldn't ask for more. And that's really what social change looks like. So it's kind of using the screen in a positive way. That's right. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to use it. Trying to take it, it back. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, what are some other like, specific stories about when you've been able to connect with uh, students that stick out to you? What keeps you doing this work? I have beautiful 
But there are such beautiful responses every time. I have pretty much almost every audience that there will be a testimonial wherein a girl says, you know, this saved my life, or mm. I've tried to commit suicide five times and couldn't figure out why I'm still here, and now I know. <laughs> and so it's, it's giving them hope. And so, you know, this, it, some of the stuff around um, getting into schools, especially the American public school system, it, it's not easy to get through the doors of a school and convince a principal to release all the girls to the venue for 90 minutes and convince the parents that taking them away from academics and focusing this time on social-emotional learning is something that they need. That's half the work, and that's not easy. Wow. But the rewards of doing it are a lot of young women take 180-degree turns in their lives. They come up to me in tears and throw their arms around me and say, I can't begin to tell you how this just changed me. And, and it's like what I've just offered them, this message, that this, this, this gem that they, they're able to walk away with. Mm -hmm. It's like what I received when I read The Beauty Myth or when I read Revolution from Within. Wow. That's amazing. Have you thought about starting uh, online book clubs? <laughs> I do have a book club on my website uh -huh. and a podcast. So uh -huh. I'd like to feature the voices of young women. Wonderful. You know? mm -hmm. Um, and how would people find you if they're well, looking well, to do that? Well, my website is briemathers.com, mm -hmm. B-R-I-E-M-A-T-H-E-R-S.com, and everything is pretty straightforward, laid out the talks and the, the blogs, the video blog, the podcast blog. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you again for being on the show. You're and, so welcome. Um, we are looking forward to getting to talk to you on the next episode with uh, three young people who were inspired by your work. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Brie. Thank you for joining us on Youth Can Change the World. To find out more about Brie's work, visit her website. Keep an eye out for our next episode where you will hear from three young women in Arlington who have been inspired by Brie's talk. Until then, love the skin you're in.